and then GDP growth starts to pick up. 2000s, we see another uh, good uh, indicator there, GDP picking up at 12.5. And then 2005 to 2000 to 2018, we see a, a stable uh, growth in the double digit uh, level, 10%, and some literature says it was even up to 15, uh, up to 15, 11, 12 there. Per capita income grew uh, to 8%. Previously, in the 90s, it was around uh, 2%. Uh, so we provide a contrast with the uh, other economies around 2004-2015, uh, you can see the performance there with uh, some of the leading economies at the time. Um, this is the per capita growth rate of Ethiopia compared to Rwanda, Tanzania, Mozambique, and Uganda. And you can see around 2010-2011, it peaked much higher compared to the rest of the countries, going up to 10%. Uh -huh. So here we look at how they did it. And uh, it's interesting that in the previous discussions, people were asking, how do we do it? How do we get there? Um, one is that the role of the state. Of course, we are discussing how can the state, the state play an important role. And Ethiopia adopted the, the concept of the developmental state that was initially um, uh, championed by the pro former prime minister, uh, Mele Zenawi. And of course, the, the Prime Minister's office, which was the main institution at the time, played a very important role. It is the highest office, as opposed to Uganda, the office of the Prime Minister is the highest office in the country. They also have a president, but she or he plays a more of a ceremonial role. So he adopted the Asian uh, approach of a developmental state. What is that state? It is. Uh, Pivoto, it is strategic, it provides a grand vision, they mobilize the community or the society or the population towards development, uh, they adopted growth enhancing uh, policies, manage their rents, uh, developmental policies, and also managing the tensions. As we know that uh, Ethiopia has also had a lot of political tensions from the different uh, ethnic regions. Uh, also, what was very important is the pressure from IMF uh, in the 90s. I think that was managed very well. Uh, they were, um, I think there are stories in the, in, the, in the literature which say that the Prime Minister was at loggerheads with the IMF and almost kicked the IMF out and refused their, their advice or their conditionalities. So most of those uniform privatization, uh, privatization and uh, opening the financial sector, those were rejected uh, outrightly. Uh, for instance, it was difficult for me to find a, a, a foreign bank there. It was only a senior bank, uh, there are local banks. There's no Stanley, there's no Stanchat, there's no ABSA there. It's all local banks, and the commercial bank still plays an important role. Uh, the other aspect has been the high uh, investment in infrastructure. So as the country uh, started envisioning their industrialization process, some of the initial steps they took is huge, massive investment in their infrastructure, uh, also supplemented by uh, aggressive domestic resource mobilization, both domestically and internationally. Uh, we have heard of the Grand Renaissance Dam, that was intended to mobilize resources for their electricity uh, production. There's also been the uh, diaspora uh, bond that is looking at funding for the, um, for the Renaissance Dam. Uh, you see, all these have had uh, some milestones, but also there are challenges with the bonds. But these were important steps that the country took. Uh, also, there has been a, a specific focus on agro-processing or industrial growth. So the role of the state, that the state took a leading role and dragged the private sector along it. It directed which sectors to invest in, it directed the financing for private sector in the specific sectors, and, some of, and those are some of the priority sectors 
that the government identified that would uh, promote growth, transformation, and poverty uh, uh, reduction. Uh, so some of the key sectors there, um, infrastructure, of course, private sector cannot invest in infrastructure. And so the government had to put up uh, policies to support uh, private sector growth in infrastructure. Um, in, in terms of agriculture, they had to focus on uh, the leather, and then manufacturing, we see cement, floriculture, again for, tech, uh, for agriculture, textile, and again agro-processing. Those were identified much earlier on, and they remain consistently the main uh, priority sectors, where private sector also played a role. Uh, in terms of policy making, so in the 1990s, uh, late 1990s, we see a revived uh, policy making approach you know, following the new leadership. And so there was a gradual, pragmatic approach to policy making. There's a lot of thinking. Such kind of meetings took place over a long period of time. And I think one of the initial policies was the Agricultural Development Industrialization Strategy of 1992. Uh, this policy uh, hammered on the issue of agro-processing because like Uganda, Ethiopia has a uh, uh, relies on agriculture as its major economic backbone. About 80 people are employed in the sector. It contributes about over 70 to the GDP. And so this policy uh, focused on uh, agro agriculture development or growth. Later on, we had other policies, the Growth and Transformation Plan. That was 2011, 2015, a five-year plan. And later, the growth, another version of that in 2016 to 2020. What did these policies look at? The first one, still agriculture, primarily agro-processing, but also touched on a few components of uh, manufacturing. And what was important in this, in this uh, policy making is that the country realized that they cannot do everything at the same time. Yes, they had opportunities. Yes, they had um, some of the resources, but they had to pick and choose. Uh, GDP, GTP 2, 2016-2020, uh, aimed at transforming the economy into a lower middle income country. You know, the recent uh, classifications by the world by 2025, uh, it's sought to in, you know, accelerate industrialization, looked at industrial parks, employment, and improving productivity. Still, these were in the agro processing sector, but still uh, complemented by uh, manufacturing. Uh, also, the, there was clarity of policy focus, uh, as opposed to many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, you know, like us, trying to kickstart growth and transformation. Uh, in the 2000s or mid 2011s, Ethiopia was not starting. It had a base where to accelerate and sustain that growth. So that informed their policy making. They wanted to sustain, as opposed to Start the growth. Incentives. Uh, we talked about taxes, tax policy, and uh, their role in the industrialization forces. Uh, these were a huge part of their industrial policy strategies. There were tax incentives in those specific um, sectors that we mentioned there. Those incentives related to tax breaks, acquiring land, access to finance.